This week is Berlin Blockchain Week, and we're so excited to be here. Actually, as I'm recording this, I just landed in Berlin and heading over to the Web3 Summit. We'll also be at DAPCON from Wednesday to Friday at the Technical University of Berlin. It's organized by Gnosis and will feature prominent members of the Ethereum and decentralized web community. Last year's event was terrific, and I really am looking forward to the second edition. Tickets are still available. Epicenter listeners can get 20% off the regular ticket price with the code DAPCON Epicenter 2019, and that's at dapcon.io. Where can you find us this week? Well, we're doing a live recording of Epicenter on Thursday, the 22nd at 10 a.m. in the main room. Sunny, Frederica, and I will discuss the state of the DAP ecosystem and take questions from the audience, so be sure to attend. We're also doing a meetup on Thursday from 6.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. Come hang out with us, have a drink. You can register for the meetup at epicenter.rocks slash Berlin meetup to get the address. All of us are also speaking or moderating panels or on panels throughout the week. So be sure to check out the schedule to find out when we're speaking and come say hi. We'd be happy to see you. Looking forward to seeing all of you at DAPCON and during the Berlin Blockchain Week. This is Epicenter, episode 301 with guest Daniel Shin. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Friederike Ernst. And so today we're speaking with Daniel Shin, who's the CEO of Terra. You may have heard of Terra recently. Uh, it is a, a stable coin that is coming out of Korea. And one of the things that's interesting about Terra is just the, the CEO's background. So Daniel is uh, an established e-commerce entrepreneur in, in Korea. He founded uh, Timon, which is one of the top three uh, e-commerce platforms uh, in Korea. So like like an Amazon equivalent in Korea. And from that experience, he saw some of the issues that e-commerce merchants face. And one of those uh, issues, and this is something that's been brought up a lot in the crypto space, is the cost of payment. So the cost of doing business uh, with regards to credit card transaction fees, et cetera. And so Terra uh, addresses this issue uh, by creating a stable coin that removes a lot of the intermediaries that exist uh, in, in the payment space. So banks, uh, intermediate banks, payment service providers, payment gateways, uh, Stripe, you know, yeah, and, and also the visa fee. So it was a, it was an interesting discussion, uh, to say the least. Yeah, so th- th- there's there's some interesting ideas here with regards to the the peg, uh, that the stablecoin, the mechanism for the peg, and uh, we went we it got a little heated there uh, for for some time. <laughs> yeah, so it, I think it was a little bit contra- controversial, and we had some argument about whether it's good enough to have the stable coin be backed by the company, in effect, um, namely the Luna t- token holders. Yeah, so uh, Daniel gave some answers as, as well. And uh, I would invite all of you to um, hear what he has to say and uh, make up your own minds. Yeah. So I, I think this is interesting because when when I first heard about Terra, the, the thing that struck me the most is I thought, wow, like this is one of the first times or maybe even the first time that I see a cryptocurrency project that has an actual go-to-market strategy and like a plan on creating demand for this currency. And that plan is that they've got this network of uh, e-commerce merchants in Korea. So food delivery apps, movie ticket apps, et cetera, that are accepting this payment system. And at the moment, they're doing about uh, half a million dollars in transactions per day. They've got 300,000 users on their, their payment app. So and they're it's only, massively successful. And, and, and they that, only launched like, 50 yeah. days ago. Right. So, yeah, it's. I mean, they, they've been really good at actually getting this on the ground and getting people to use it. Right. And But so one of your points of contention was uh, that you think that this doesn't work, that like the peg doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. So basically, my, my point of contention was that I made the point that I think this works as long as there's an expectation of growth, but that the system inherently can't 
can't cope with shrinkage and basically being convinced that it can't hold up in the event of a black, black swan event, that will damage the system and its credibility and that it may cause it to fall apart even if no black swan event actually happens. I think like if we were to compare this to something like Maker, it's like Maker is collateralized by by Ether, it's over collateralized by Ether. And so there's something backing it there. Now, one could argue that Ether by which Maker is backed is also backed by some expectation of future profit or like future value. Uh, whereas with Terra, there's no underlying collateral. The only thing that keeps the peg is the expectation of future growth through uh, this seniorage model that they have and also the transaction fees that they pay to their to their validators. And so you had a, you had you took issue with that um, particularly because you think that you know if there is some catastrophic uh, event where there's loss lock, loss of confidence in Terra for whatever reason, it it'll be, be the spiral of death for them. Yeah, so I was very much the bad cop on this episode. <laughs> My view is that I think that, so the person we interviewed was obviously Daniel, the CEO. We, there was also a, a, another co-founder. He wrote the white paper or co-authored the white paper. His name is Do Kwan. He's the more sort of technical person. The reason why I'm somewhat uh, bullish on this, on this project is because of sort of like Daniel's uh, background in e-commerce and, and as sort of like more on the business side, um, being able to like create something that's valuable for like, a lot of people and understanding like the real business opportunities and problems that companies face. And I think the design of this thing probably isn't perfect. Like there's some parts that like definitely I think uh, could be improved, like the Oracle mechanism, which we go into during the interview. Also, it appears that right now validators are mining at a loss. But so these these things that probably aren't optimal at the moment. I think can be adjusted and fixed over time. But as long as they have this vision of building this payment network and uh, addressing this issue that, you know, like hundreds of thousands of companies over the world are faced with, as long as that exists, I think that they can be successful. And so that's why I'm, I'm kind of bullish on it. More on the like business go-to-market side than so much on the, on the technology. But I think the technology is kind of cool too. It kind of looks like... Uh, I don't know. It, 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 it resembles Libra in some sense on the strategy side. No, not on the economics. So I think I think I very much come from the from the technology mechanism design school of thinking. And I can totally see that they've done a tremendous job in getting traction for this in such a short amount of time. And obvi obviously, um, Daniel has a formidable background, but it's very much a mindset that is fueled by the expectation of growth. And basically, I, I agree that it'll, it's a good model as long as there is growth. But I think that it can't withhold a Black Swan event. Okay, well, I, I guess we'll see. So we hope you, you'll enjoy this, this interview with Daniel. So actually, this is interesting because we're actually sitting across from each other in the studio uh, at Full Node. We've never done an episode uh, where both of us are sitting here in the studio. So it was, it was kind of like interesting dynamic. Um, to, to be able to, uh, yeah, like not be on a Skype call. So yeah, I hope we'll get to do this more often. I, I really like it. Also, I like I, I the, the intro is very much different now that like we could actually talk to each other from yeah, face absolutely. to face. All right. So with that, here's our interview with Daniel Shin. We are here with Daniel Shin. Daniel is the CEO of Terra. And previously, he was the CEO and co-founder of Timon. And Timon is one of the largest e-commerce platforms in Korea. Uh, they're regularly in the top three. And so today we're going to talk about uh, about Terra and also uh, his experience in the e-commerce space uh, as a successful e-commerce entrepreneur in Korea and how that drove him to uh, enter the cryptocurrency and blockchain space uh, with this new project. Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. So starting off, yeah, let's let's spend a little bit of time on your background because, you know, if you're, if we look at our history of, of guests on the show, I'd say it's quite unusual to have someone with such successful background as like uh, an e-commerce entrepreneur building one of the largest platforms in the country uh, and then just totally switch and transition to the crypto space. Yeah, tell us a bit about your background and how that led you to uh, where you are today, building Terra. So I grew up in the States for most of my life uh, in the East Coast. And in 2010, I came back to Korea where I was born. And 
that was right about the time where Groupon was one of the fastest growing companies in the world, uh, one of the hottest companies in the world. And uh, we uh, decided to replicate that model in Korea. After about a year of running the Groupon model, we realized that pivoting the business towards mobile commerce uh, provided a larger opportunity because while Amazon had such a foothold in the U.S., uh, there was no such equivalent in uh, other parts of the world like Korea. And uh, we saw mobile as an opportunity to really drive growth uh, behind e-commerce and mobile commerce. So uh, I ran the company for about eight years as a CEO. We grew from five people to uh, 1,300. The final year, uh, we were doing about $3.5 billion in transactions and had roughly 20% of the country use our platform at least once a year, which was pretty cool. But you may also know that e-commerce runs on razor thin margins. So after cost of goods and logistics and fulfillment and promotions and marketing, uh, there's not much left to the company. And uh, we thought one of the line items that we wanted to make go away was the payment cost. So we were paying upwards of two point something percent on every transaction that we did. And, you know, that was kind of the rule of the game for the past couple of decades. But with the advent of blockchain, we thought, uh, you know, I thought that was an opportunity to change that for our business at Timon, as well as e-commerce businesses across the world. This definitely resonates with me. I mean, I, I started my career in e-commerce, um, uh, not at the same skill as as you did, but uh, you know, I, I worked uh, a lot with e-commerce clients, and yeah, payments has always been a pain, like for so many reasons, but also for for its costs. And you know, in 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 the beginning of like when I started getting into Bitcoin and everything, that was kind of one of the promises of crypto is that like cryptocurrencies allow for these peer to peer payments, and the transaction costs are much lower than anything else that's available out there, like Visa, Mastercard, like most of the most of these these payment platforms. You know, from, from that context, what is it that led you to want to build Terra and where did you find that cryptocurrencies in general as they exist weren't fulfilling you know, that goal of having low transaction costs for, for payment transactions? I think innately, uh, I'm an entrepreneur that really enjoys the early part of a startup, an industry or a topic that is currently unsolved and we're not sure if we can solve it, but if we do, it's a big win for myself and rest of the country. So I thought for e-commerce as a broader industry, blockchain coming in and solving the taxation that payment companies levy on each transaction as a mission worth going after. Having said that, I looked at the hundreds of projects that were getting funded and it was a bit shocking to me how little of a plan they had to connect with the real world economy and get it adopted and mass distributed across, you know, the regular people, the non crypto traders. I thought there was a role that I could play in bridging e-commerce as a broader industry with blockchain and crypto. You know, you've, we've seen fintech companies uh, do this in the past, right? So. And Financial, one of the largest fintech companies in the world, they piggybacked as a payment feature on Alibaba and transformed itself by adding other financial features to become one of the largest digital banks in the world. In a similar fashion, we thought blockchain and crypto could really benefit from uh, having an alliance of e-commerce companies as a distribution channel. So there are already a couple of stable coin solutions out there, right? So I can totally see why you would want to use a, why you would want to build a, a an e-commerce platform on a stable token, because basically having, having this in a volatile asset doesn't make much sense. But why did you choose to build a new system rather than building upon one of the stable coins that's already out there or one of the stable coin designs that is already out there? Yeah, so uh, we reviewed most of the white papers that were published at the time. And big issue that payments companies need to solve is 
a two-pronged problem. So you have to become cheaper and more efficient for e-commerce merchants. And on the other hand, you need to provide a tangible benefit as to why customers use it, right? So the former allows you to integrate with more and more e-commerce partners and impacts fungibility, whereas the latter uh, really improves upon your share of checkout and getting consumers to adopt it. So uh, I feel like other stable coins could have addressed the stability issue as well as uh, cheaper payment costs to merchant issue. But I thought from a consumer perspective, there's absolutely no reason to switch off of a credit card option or a digital uh, wallet option to a stable coin option because why is there, right? So c can you briefly explain what kind of a stable uh, coin Terra is? I think we'll go into more detail later, but just to give um, an overview. Yeah, so Terra keeps itself stable using a uh, elastic money supply. So if demand for Terra goes up by integrating with more e-commerce companies, then to prevent the prices from going up, the algorithm issues uh, more Terra to uh, keep itself against the peg. If demand for Terra comes down, then we buy up supply in the open market and burn supply in order to bring the price back up to the peg. The uh, interesting component exists on both sides of the scenario. So if we're constantly adding new e-commerce companies and driving more demand to Terra, and that uh, allows us to increase the circulating supply of Terra, then in economics terms, that's called seniorage. And we're able to take that resource and reinvest that in discounts to consumers. So uh, we talked briefly about why other stable coins don't work. It's because uh, there's no reason to switch from legacy platforms. The reason why people are using Terra today is because we're able to give 5-10% discounts on every transaction that you do on e-commerce, whether it's you know buying fashion apparel or diapers or travel or whatever it may be. On the downside case where we need to buy up Terra, we collateralize the network with a second token called Luna. So Luna is our Depost mining token that receives transaction fee rewards from Terra's uh, payment network. And Luna, in short, uh, derives value because uh, Luna will be valued at some multiple of the transaction fee cash flows that come into uh, Luna holders. And we take that value and in the times of Terra recessions, we use it to uh, collateralize Terra's network. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here and we're, we're going to get into all the details of this over the episode. You, you said something here that you wanted to create demand for this currency. How do you plan to create demand for the currency? Because I believe like that is the, the real thing that's holding the peg together is the expectation of future demand. Yeah, so demand is created by two things. So constantly integrating with more and more partners, uh, which are you know e-commerce partners, fashion e-commerce partners, uh, you know movie ticket apps, food delivery apps, uh, whatever it may be. And second, increasing our share of checkout uh, within those platforms. So how are we able to integrate with more and more partners? The answer is because we're able to reduce transaction fees for these platforms, but uh, how are we able to constantly increase share of checkout is because we're able to use the se seniors' profits to offer ongoing discounts for consumers. So if you're buying the same good or the same service, if there's multiple checkout options, consumers are likely to choose the one that provides the best deal. So we feel like more and more people will learn about Terra and will select Terra as their payment option, increasing our share of checkout. This kicks in the virtuous cycle of increasing the demand for Terra, which allows us to print more supply of Terra and further take that seniorage profits to uh, give more discounts back to the community. There's a natural limit to this though, right? Because basically the uh, entire e-commerce space um, has a ceiling and after a certain point, you will not be able to offer these seniorage profits to people who used to pay in Terra anymore, right? 
naturally growth will slow as we become much larger, but e-commerce as an industry is, uh, you know, trillions of dollars across the world. And e-commerce is just the gateway for us to get into other industries, right? So, uh, you know, there's no reason Terra can't be used in purchasing uh, cars, fueling your car, uh, in buying insurance, in buying your home. You know, I think the ceiling does exist at some point, but it's very, very high and won't come for decades. Okay, so so you think that there's a, a lot of headway for demand for Terra and essentially e-commerce is sort of like the gateway and you can then expand into other industries and even at some point maybe even i don't know b2b payments does that also make sense yeah absolutely but even in the baseline scenario where we're connected with a subset of e-commerce companies and our share of checkout does not increase e-commerce as an industry across asia is growing at 20 30 percent year over year so even if we are not able to onboard onboard more partners, even if you're not able to increase share of checkout, we're still going to grow 30% year over year. Uh, but that is not the case. We're going to add more partners. We're going to add more industries uh, and more use cases for Terra down the road. So what's going to happen once you can't grow hundreds or tens of percent year on year? So what, what happens if demand for Terra as a stablecoin um, is constant? Well, our worst case scenario is looking just like the best fintech companies across the world. <laughs> so basically, we'll be an Alipay or a PayPal or uh, a Venmo if we're not able to use Seniorish to pay for discounts. Uh, however, uh, the way that we think about it is we have an economy uh, that we can piggyback to uh, really grow our business with virtually no cost of acquisition cost, uh, or cost of customer acquisition. And once we have, you know, hundreds of millions of customers on our platform, there's so many more ways to increase uh, seniorage. For example, uh, we can reduce the velocity of money. So get people to pre-charge their apps so that the velocity goes down, which increases the supply of money. Uh, we can introduce lending and investments on the app, which also multiplies the amount of money that goes through Terra and Chai. So uh, I, I think the opportunities are limitless. But if we take for a second that, you know, we can do 100 billion in transactions over the next five years and 10 percent of that is used to uh, give discounts to consumers and uh, in turn is used as a way to acquire customers, then 10 billion dollars is funneled into our ecosystem without using venture capital money to grow our business to uh, wherever we can take it. So what happens once um, demand, for whatever reason, so say there, there, there's a global recession or climate crisis hits or Regulatory confidence in the product plummets. Um, so what happens if the demand for Terra goes down? So how is it, how is it collateralized or is it collateralized? Yeah, so first line of defense is our Luna token. And uh, recall that Luna token is our mining token. And uh, if you help validate transactions, you receive transaction fee rewards from Terra's payment network. So let's take for instance that we do a $5 billion uh, annually in transactions and we take 50 basis points in uh, transaction fees. Then that's $25 million being paid to Luna holders over the year. So the way that you value Luna should be some multiple of that $25 million. So uh, for example, Visa trades at, I believe, 50 to 60x their profits. Stripe uh, and PayPal probably trades above that. So uh, you know we can take FinTech comparables and apply a multiple, and that's what Luna should be trading at. The second layer of defense is we take the transaction fees that are uh, levied to e-commerce and we temporarily increase that if there's downward pressure in Luna's price to the point where the collateral cannot fully collateralize Terra. So recall that e-commerce pays, uh, say, 3% of their transaction volume per year. Terra charges 
like I said, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 basis points. So there's a 5, 6x uh, ability to up our transaction fees without the e-commerce companies turning off of our payment network. So uh, in the times of uh, Luna downward pressure, uh, we're able to 2x, 3x our transaction fees so that it counters the downward pressure in Luna price. Uh, the final measure that I'll talk about is something that we want to uh, wean off of down the road is we will have a very, very healthy cash reserve as well. Uh, and we recognize that in the very, very beginning, we don't have enough e-commerce partners across enough geographies to say that, okay, we, we will not drop by 50% in a given year. But just as governments weaned off to fractional reserves over time, so that we're fully reliant on Luna when we have thousands of partners across many, many countries and doing you know, tens of billions in transactions. Let's, let's walk through a user flow here. So let's say I'm in, in Korea and I want to use Terra to benefit from these decreased transaction fees on like my favorite e-commerce site. Like let's say I want to buy movie tickets or something. What does that look like for the user from you know, the moment he's heard about Terra to the transaction and maybe you know explain what's going on in the background while this is happening basically the user flow is identical to what you would do before so you would turn on your movie ticket app you would select the movie that you want to buy and when you go to the checkout page you will see multiple pay options including the payment option that Terra provides called Chai so you would click on Chai. If you're a first-time user of Chai, then you would have to integrate your bank account to it and uh, sign up for the app. Right. So the, I think I, that's that's what I'm most interested in. So onboarding onboarding this payment system, what does that look like for the user in terms of acquiring Terra, and what's happening in the background for that for that Terra to be minted, and how it relates to like Luna, for example. So essentially. You sign up for the app the first time, you uh, do KYC, and you link up your bank account. The banks offer an API integration where we're able to uh, essentially command the bank to pull from the account when the user is purchasing something. And so uh, once you've signed up for that app, uh, as you go through the e-commerce flow, if you click the product, you click Chai and with a six digit code or a face ID, you're able to pay for the product in uh, you know, a couple seamless steps. What's happening in the background is the uh, money is pulled from your bank account and it's converted to Chai points. And Chai points are linked to Terra. So uh, essentially for you know, $100 of Chai that you charge up, your app, a hundred dollars of Terra is held in the background, and uh, what that allows us to do is impact demand in Terra with the growth of transaction volume on the Chai side. If transaction volume grows, then Chai would have to basically buy up more Terra in order to match that demand, and uh, that puts upward pressure in the price of Terra which uh, allows the uh, arbitrage mechanism to print more Terra and increase the supply to uh, counter the upswing in price. Okay, so let me just interject here. So what, as, as a user, I connect to my bank account and I use my existing fiat reserves to, to buy some Terra. Where is that Terra coming from? And so is, is the bank somehow connected to the system and enabling that Terra to be minted? How does that minting process work? So your purchase does not mint the Terra. Essentially, when you transact, the fiat on-ramp happens through your bank account. And uh, indirectly, the fiat that you've on-ramped is used uh, essentially to buy up Terra that's, that's already been minted. So uh, as you can imagine, if there's a set supply of Terra, but if more people are demanding the Terra, then the price should swing upwards. And we have arbitrage mechanisms in place 
where if Terra's price goes up, then people are encouraged to deposit money and receive Terra uh, so that they could uh, sell it in the open market and create uh, more supply of Terra, if, if that makes sense. So basically, if people then deposit more money in order to mint more Terra, where does that Terra come from? I think that's still where I'm stuck. L let's just say it comes from uh, exchanges. But where do the exchanges get it from? Exchanges already had a set supply of Terra, right? I think what we're missing here is really the mechanism by which Terra is minted when there's an increased demand for Terra and there's not enough Terra in the market. Yeah. The mechanics that uh, you need to understand is the demand for Terra and the minting of Terra is actually uh, two separate sequences. So uh, if through our payment network, uh, more people are uh, depositing fiat and converting it for Terra because it's a better way to pay for things, then uh, let's just assume that that Terra is bought from exchange A. And because we don't want people to go to the exchange themselves and sign up for exchanges and hold their private keys and whatnot, let's say we uh, have a custody service where we do that on their behalf. If transaction volume increases, then we buy up more Terra, which obviously with the same number of supply puts upward pressure on the price of Terra. So if Terra used to be a dollar and if transaction volume goes up by 10%, then Terra's prices go up to, you know, a dollar 10. We have a separate smart contract in place where if, if you deposit a dollar's worth of Luna, then you will get a Terra in return. So uh, think for a second when people would make that trade. People would make that trade if Terra is trading above a dollar, right? So you deposit a dollar's worth of Luna by buying it up on an exchange into the smart contract and you get one Terra, which is currently trading at dollar 10. Then these people would take it and sell it into the exchange and capture the 10 cent arbitrage profit until that 10 cents goes away. So the first component impacts the second component, but they're actually two completely separate sequences where e-commerce volume impacts the demand and price of Terra. And then there's a smart contract that creates an arbitrage opportunity for traders, which impacts the elastic supply of Terra. Okay, so basically the Luna holders are the people who profit from the increase in Terra. So this is where the profits flow to, right? Well, you don't necessarily have to be a Luna holder because you can buy a dollar's worth of Luna at any given time and trade it for Terra uh, at that instant uh, if Terra is trading above a dollar. Okay, but basically, so you have to have Luna in order to benefit from this, right? I mean, you can, I mean, you can buy it. You didn't ac actually have to buy it in the token sale, but you can just buy it on an exchange, but you have to buy Luna. So basically, the profit does go to Luna holders. Correct. So how are you able to um, pass this profit on to people who actually pay for things on the e-commerce platform? Because you said that you can give like 5, 10% discounts to the users of your payment service. How is uh, the money that is um, distributed to Luna holders, how does this actually end up with the customers? Recall that the smart contract trades a new Terra that gets minted for a Luna that gets deposit, deposited into the smart contract. So uh, basically the Terra that we minted is new supply, whereas the Luna that we received is from a previous fixed supply, right? Yes. So we as a uh, protocol uh, take those Luna proceeds because it's been deposited and uh, there's a voting mechanism in place to... Uh, a funnel uh, that proceeds, which uh, we can call seniorage, to e-commerce discounts or any other use cases that we think will drive the growth of Terra's economy. Basically, the Luna that was deposited is the proceed. So basically, th does the proceed come from the fact that uh, you as a company hold a large portion of the Luna? Uh, no, that's that's incorrect. So basically, we were able to 
create more demand for Terra through our uh, e-commerce transaction volume going up. And uh, that created an arbitrage opportunity where uh, we're able to mint more Terra uh, and sell that to people who wants to buy it. And so those people who buy it, they deposit a Luna and receive a Terra in return, right? So the Luna that just got deposited into the smart contract becomes proceeds for us to distribute back into to the ecosystem. But the person who's actually minted the Terra got the seniorage, right? I mean, they got the seniorage proceeds. So how, how, how do you pass on these benefits to the people who use Terra to pay for things? So the Terra isn't minted by a person, right? It's minted by the protocol automatically when someone deposits a Luna, right? So basically, uh, the protocol in the case that Terra demand is increasing will end up with, you know, a certain amount of Luna. Let, let, let's call it, I don't know, like $20 million is deposit into, into the smart contract in order to whittle away at the arbitrage opportunity created in Terra prices. Then uh, we have a separate uh, voting mechanism by Luna holders to take that $20 million and deposit that into projects that help grow Terra's economy. So right now, the largest project that we're running is basically the payment network. So we would essentially earmark the $20 million to the payment network to be able to spend that as promotional dollars against purchases of goods and services. Okay, so I think I understand. So basically, the, the Luna holders um, in their entirety or by some voting mechanism decide that the profits that they have made by the growth um, of the Terra ecosystem is distributed not to them, but to the users of Terra. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, that's correct. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Cosmos the internet of blockchains. Cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it. Blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all. As a dApp developer, you need the tools that will allow your dApp to scale, grow, and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof of stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing dApp to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. So switching gears a little bit here, let's talk about the uh, the validators in the Terra network. Uh, in the white paper, you refer to them as miners. And could you talk about the role of these validators and how they're remunerated for their work uh, in validating transactions? Yeah, so uh, it's a uh, DPoS system uh, very similar to the Cosmos network. And uh, right now we have about uh, 66 validators or uh, miners, if you will. And we've currently capped it at 100. So later uh, the validators would be ranked by the Luna that's staked to them. And the main role that they play is uh, first and foremost to uh, validate the transactions themselves. Another role that they play is to uh, receive price feeds for uh, Terra and Luna. And lastly, the Luna holders uh, play voting role uh, or a governance role in distributing the seniorage profits that we uh, just talked about. Okay. Can you talk about the Oracle? and what, What's the role of the Oracle in the sort of Terra design? Yeah, so uh, basically we need feeds for the local currencies that we peg to. So uh, it could be the Korean won, the Singapore dollar, the Thai baht. We need feeds for uh, Terra's prices and Luna's prices. 
So uh, we obviously need feeds for the local currencies because Terra needs to peg to it and it falling off of the local currency would create an arbitrage opportunity. Uh, we need the Terra and Luna prices because, again, we, uh, as a smart contract, make a promise to uh, swap dollars worth of Luna for Terra at any given time. So those are essentially the price feeds that uh, we need. Okay. And so I, I believe you're also issuing a, a Terra uh, SDR. And so like SDR is this special drawing right uh, issued by the IMF, which is a basket of currencies that creates this stable currency. And it's used to like for countries like to pay their debt or something like that. Why did you choose to also create a, a, an SDR peg? It's kind of unusual and, and unique. Yeah, so uh, our fundamental uh, thinking was that businesses in non-U.S. parts of the world don't want to be settled in the U.S. dollar. So everybody wants to be settled in their local currency because very few businesses are wanting to take on the foreign exchange risk. So uh, we've created the KRT, which pegs to the Korean won here uh, and uh, we're looking to create uh, HKT and SGT, which pegs to the Hong Kong dollar and the Singapore dollar. But because we only have one Luna, one collateral, we needed to pick a currency that is the least volatile over a long period of time to uh, peg the value of Luna to. So uh, essentially, we selected SDR as that you know, mother Terra, if you will, you can imagine a scenario where, you know, several decades down the road, uh, Luna converges more to the portfolio mix of the local currencies in Terra's network rather than to a uh, basket that's issued by the IMF. But we thought IMF SDR is, at least in the beginning, the best representation of the global network that we aspire to uh, uh, capture. So you said that the Luna is pegged to the SDR and then all of the other exchange rates, so whether that's the Korean won, Singapore dollar, US dollar, et cetera, get their exchange rate relative to SDR. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Yes. Okay. Interesting. It, it kind of occurred to me that there are a lot of similarities between the underlying economics behind the SDR and something like like Libra, because Libra is also a bas basket of currencies. Uh, it's pegged to a basket of currencies. Did you see any like interesting dynamics here? Like, for example, you know, if, should the IMF issue an SDR cryptocurrency? Would that make like the Libra and perhaps even the Terra and like a lot of cryptocurrencies, I think, obsolete? Have you given any thought to that? So I, I think the purpose of using SDR or a basket of currencies for uh, you know Libra and SDR in the case of Terra, is we envision having a global portfolio of businesses. And because we don't know what those proportions are yet, uh, we need to peg to something that's already a basket of global currencies, which is SDR. So I think we use it more as a convenient index to start off with, rather than SDR is the you know, end all and be all of currencies. So uh, ultimately, like I said, the Terra that gets most often used in practice is going to be the Korean won Terra or the Singapore dollar Terra or the Thai bot Terra. But uh, because we are one network that operates in multiple local currencies, we do need some sort of mother exchange, which uh, SDR plays the proxy to at the moment. So I, I don't think, you know, IMF issuing a currency is going to, uh, you know, end all crypto stablecoin businesses. Uh, I, I think I think it's very far from the truth. No, maybe just as a reaction to to, to Libra, you know, uh, Christine Lagarde could be like, "We're going to launch our own cryptocurrency <laughs> to counteract the Libra." I don't know; it'd be, it'd be funny. Yeah, yeah. So, tell me about the validators again. So, say I'm interested in becoming a validator. How do I become a validator on your network? And um, how are the validators as they are today? So, the 66 people, or the 66 companies you talked about earlier, how are they distributed, and what qualifies them to be a validator? So, as all early networks do, I think we try to either uh, pick validators 
you know, that have a track record of success in a uh, similar uh, operations. And because we took lots of the components from the Cosmos Atom and Cosmos SDK, uh, lots of our validators overlap with those of the Cosmos Atom. Uh, and we also invited our investor base because uh, in, in theory, our investors are biggest fans and uh, those who support our uh, broader vision. So, you know, guys like, you know, Polychain or Hashed are investors in Terra's network who also run validators for us. So in the beginning, I guess you could say most of the validators received kind of handpicked invites based on the two criteria that I talked about, having a track record on Cosmos or uh, supportive investors to Terra. Uh, down the road, the validator list will be capped at 100 and it'll be ranked by the Luna stake. So uh, obviously the stake that people will uh, stake with them will be dependent on you know, the fees that they charge, but more importantly, how secure their network is and the downtime and the track record that they build on, on our, our network. So uh, you know, I guess in a way you could think of it as a uh, vote of confidence based on how, how well they perform. So if I understand correctly, the validators are currently still mining at a loss despite the fact that the transaction volume is like half a million a day. Would you confirm that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure the economics of each validator. However, as I've shared early in this call, the transaction volume is going up, you know, 20, 30, 40% each week. And secondly, we started off with a very, very low transaction fee to e-commerce, uh, just as a entry point into the market. But we've been received with, you know, good feedback so far. So uh, we're looking to increase those fees as well. So I think if any validator is operating at a loss, those losses will be very, very short-lived. Okay. And so you mentioned that, and this is something we haven't really talked about, but so Terra is is built on the Cosmos SDK. Why did you choose to to build on Cosmos? And what went into your into that in that choice? And then, you know, what are your plans for like the future of of Terra as you know a zone on the Cosmos hub, presumably? I, I think to be fair, uh, we didn't build on top of Cosmos. We we took lots of the components from Cosmos SDK because we looked at how they work and you know, thought they were uh, fitting for what we want to accomplish. Number one component is transaction speeds. So for Terra, because we're working with existing businesses that do, uh, you know, thousands of transactions per day, the ability to get TPS up beyond, say, you know, two, three thousand is uh, extremely important. So uh, Cosmos, their, their blockchain has been uh, tested for transaction speeds and our testnet as well, uh, taking the best parts of Tendermint, uh, have done TPS up to seven, eight thousand uh, uh, per second. The second component is we have a vision of not only connecting to e-commerce as payments, but serving as essentially a stability component for lots of the D apps across other mainnet ecosystems. So, uh, you know, our, our belief is that just about any application on the blockchain will require a stable coin because if you, you know, contribute code or if you contribute content or if you contribute, you know, just about anything, nobody wants to be paid in a volatile token. So, uh, we needed the ability to, uh, essentially hub across to, uh, other, uh, mainnet. So, uh, we've already signed partnerships with, uh, you know, guys like, you know, Tomo Chain in Southeast Asia, Clayton here in Korea, and several other mainnet, and Cosmos, obviously, with their hub, uh, offers an opportunity for us to offer stability as a service. So I'd very much like to get back to the economics of Terra as a stable token. So as I understand it currently, Terra is valuable because of its expectation of future demand. And um, in the case that it should go south for whatever reason. It's primarily backed by the Luna token holders. And in essence, that is what in the legacy world would be the company, right? So basically, it's it's in, in effect, 
it's backed by the company or the network. So because it's backed by the by the Luna token. To me, it seems that the value of all Luna tokens together should be a fraction of the total volume that's being exchanged in Terra tokens over the network. Would you disagree with this? No, I think it's for the most part correct. Okay. So what happens, I mean, in legacy terms, that would correspond to a very severe under collateralization of the Terra that's being issued, right? And I mean, I know that in the cryptocurrency space, um, people are always going on about how the, the dollar is not backed by anything because the Fed can just create it. But for the largest part, that's not actually true because most dollars are actually backed by things. So basically, if I take out a mortgage on my house, yes, uh, the bank can create those dollars, but they have my house as collateral. If I finance my car, they have my car as collateral. Or if I, even if I take out credit card uh, debt, they have me as collateral, my future earnings and my expectations um, as someone who has valuable skills. Because, I mean, you can see that in the fact that they don't give credit card credit to anyone, or if they do, this system fails. As I see it, the Terra system is backed very much by the expectation of growth. And what happens if that is no longer there? What happens if, if for any reason, the demand falls beyond what can be absorbed by the lunar holders? Uh, do you have a, do you have some form of, of plan for like a catastrophic failure or or like a confidence spiral where the confidence in the system and the expectation of future returns would like fall apart? So I I don't think there is a single answer that provides the most benefits for users and allows you to scale and grow while at the same time uh, fully minimizes all the risks. So I think. Basically, if you have a risk reward chart, you kind of have to pick an optimal point that allows you to scale and grow while at the same time is very well hedged against risk. Basically, we looked at fully fiat collateralized stablecoins and our theory is that outside of crypto exchanges, it's never going to be used because again, the world is already digital in many parts of the developed countries. Uh, your credit card is digital in nature, your bank wires are digital, and uh, it, it's very expensive and hard for you to get people to switch off of a legacy system and use something new when you're not providing tangible benefits for them to do so. On the other side is a maker DAO where the collateral is essentially Ethereum, and Ethereum value is completely based on uh, the demand for Ethereum. And there's no fundamental cash flow or driver that determines the value of the Ethereum. So I think uh, what we said was, hey, we can't be fully fiat collateralized because ultimately we'll never grow beyond our crypto niche. We can't be collateralized with you know, Ethereum or other crypto assets that don't have a fundamental cash flow. So let's take for example that we've collateralized ourselves with the equity of Visa, right? And if you take a look at equity of Visa, uh, essentially payment network for the past uh, decade, and you can you know, take equity of Visa, you can take equity of uh, Amex, and you'll see that the revenue and equity of Visa is actually uh, fairly linear and upwards. And I think that's a testament to the stickiness of payment networks. So once platforms are onboarded to payment networks, the likelihood of them churning off of it, i.e. the likelihood of them not offering you the ability to pay with a certain method to do business is very, very, very low. So uh, we picked a category that's fundamentally sticky, but there's two things that we needed to admit. The first is that in the beginning, we're not Visa, right? Our payment network is a lot smaller. Our merchant base is a lot smaller and a lot more concentrated in a single country. So we need to be fully backed by fiat. But as we grow our merchant base, we can we can wean off of the fiat reserve and start to depend on the uh, equity of Visa, which for us is Luna. The second component is we not only need to have a sticky base like Visa, but we need to be a lot more stable than that. And that's why we 
have the ability to calibrate our transaction fees from e-commerce up to you know six to eight times of what we normally charge because we're taking payment gateway fees down from you know three percent to below 0.5 percent so if there's downward pressure in the price of luna i.e let's say we lose half of our merchant base in a single day we're able to up our transaction fees by 2x in order to counter that so that the fees that the luna holders are receiving remain steady and constant let's say for an example that we were trading at 50x our transaction fee cash flow and the 50x multiple comes down to 25 the same thing can occur we can up our transaction fees to e-commerce by 2x and the reward per luna will still stay the same so uh, i think the fundamental thesis that we have is in a design that's fundamentally sticky let's add in a factor of calibration so that we can minimize a significant amount of risk so I agree that this this will work in a setting where there's growth, but I think the legacy money system, to a large extent, is backed by the fact that there is actually real value that collateralizes it. And in the case of MakerDAO, there's Ether that collateralizes it, and in the future there'll be other things that will be able to collateralize um, DAI, much, uh, much like uh, in the legacy system where I can collateralize a dollar loan that I take out with my house. And that's not the case yeah. So basically, I mean, that despite the fact that you don't think that, for instance, in the maker system, the global settlement is actually going to take place, it's a credible threat that it could take place and everything would be settled and everyone would be fed from the underlying collateral. And in the, in the terror system, this is not the case. In the terror system, if the bottom falls out, there's nothing to break the fall. Well, I would argue that that's not true, right? So. What's the fundamental value driver of Ethereum? The fundamental value driver of Ethereum is the usage of the network. So basically the, the gas transaction fees that are paid for being allowed to use the network. And that's what fuels the value of Ethereum. Okay. And what multiple of the gas that is received is Ethereum traded at today? It's much more than it should be. So I don't know from the top of my head, uh, but basically from, from current usage levels, it should probably be below what it currently trades at. So you're making it a good point that there's also speculation going on that it's going to become utilized more in the future. And there's an expectation of future profit from holding Ether now. But there is a fundamental utility of the Ether token in paying for the for the network fees i don't know the exact number either but the multiples are so astronomically high that i don't even think it really matters how much gas is received to the network it's almost pure 99 percent speculation where ether prices are on a given day that that's my theory for luna the fundamental value is the e-commerce network that sits below it so right now it's 25 e-commerce unicorns across Asia and the alliance of Terra will grow as people understand the value proposition that we provide to uh, their business and their customers. So if you believe that the alliance members churning off the platform is actually fairly difficult because we're offering them something that's uh, relatively hard to replicate, and if you believe that once we get to several thousand e-commerce companies across Asia, losing a couple dozen is not going to harm the network in a significant way, then I think you can buy into the fact that a speculative security like Ethereum is a lot more risky than using Luna, which is basically a replication of uh, X percent of the share of checkout on e-commerce. I totally get that point. And I think that losing a couple of merchants or even like 5% is not going to break the system. I'm talking about resistance to black swan event, events. So basically like a financial crisis. I mean, even, even if the likelihood of that occurring um, are slim, the trust that a system can withstand a challenge like that um, is, in my view, absolutely crucial 
in gaining traction and actually having people use it. Yeah, absolutely. But even in the worst financial crisis, like if you ask, will Amazon go away? I would say no. Like having been in e-commerce for the past decade, actually more people switch away from more expensive gourmet options to buying on e-commerce in the cases of recessions. So I would say the cash flows that come from e-commerce will uh, stay relatively constant. The second component is that Terra is now exchangeable for real goods and services in just about all parts of your life. And I think that exudes a level of trust that you know a trading focused token on exchanges uh, cannot cannot do. Yeah, after this conversation, I feel like the the utility value in Terra is orders of magnitude higher than for for instance, like the actual utility value of of ether as gas in the Ethereum network. But yeah, I'm still I'm still like I guess un, unsure about like sort of this black swan event. Like what would happen in, in that case? And I guess like only time will tell if the peg can maintain itself. Like even Maker has had some issues like maintaining this peg recently. But yeah, so as as we're moving t- towards the end of the show here, uh, tell us a little bit about like what's the what's the future roadmap here, uh, both on so the technical side, but also in building this payment network and and, and this partner network in Asia. We've integrated to two of our twenty five alliance members so far, and in a matter of uh, fifty days, we've gotten to uh, three hundred thousand payment users and. Uh, about half a million dollars a day in transaction volume. So our immediate roadmap is to roll out the payment network across uh, all of our alliance members, which include you know the largest food delivery network in Korea, the uh, you know largest uh, movie theater network in Korea, and so on and so forth. If we're able to do that in not only Korea but other parts of Asia, that uh, we have alliance members in. Uh, we essentially have a uh, licensed uh, e-money and uh, payment gateway uh, app in each of those markets. Uh, we have liquidity in the local stable currency. So you know, Korean Terra in Korea, uh, you know, the uh, Singapore Terra in Singapore, and we have uh, compliance measures in each of those countries. So it's very easy for us to offer. Uh, global settlements, global uh, payments, and global remittances, uh, because again, we have a locally pegged stablecoin and liquidity in each of those markets. So uh, I think uh, expanding the network beyond uh, just Korea is kind of our midterm goal. Beyond that, uh, I think we'll follow a lot of the footsteps of uh, Alipay, but introduce a blockchain element to that. So if through e-commerce payments, we're able to capture uh, millions of customers uh, and lots of data around what they're buying on a daily basis, then we're able to provide uh, you know, credit to uh, e-commerce consumers. We're able to provide loans to e-commerce merchants. Uh, we're able to uh, introduce investment products. So uh, I think there's other layers of a digital bank that we can very naturally expand to uh, once uh, payments is up and running and we have access to uh, customer data. So uh, I think, you know, I can go on and on about how we be- go from payments to, uh, you know, a digital bank to beyond that, you know, the de facto global currency of the world. But I think that provides kind of a good, you know, five-year roadmap for us. I think my very last question is a meta question. So what informed the decision to actually build this as a blockchain product? Why didn't you build like a Visa or MasterCard competitor that just charges lower fees? Because in, in essence, th- that was your, your, your pain point, right? So you didn't, you didn't want to pay the 2-3% that Visa and MasterCard charge. And they have enormous profit margins because in essence, the market is divided up among among these two companies. So wh- why did you not decide to create a non-blockchain based payment system that just charges lower fees and gains traction that way? Because from, from where I'm currently standing, it seems like the blockchain element, yes, this is fantastic to actually accelerate this in the beginning because you're you're able to distribute 
the expectation of future profits to the users today, and that helps you gain traction. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a well-designed system or it's a system that can withstand, you know, for whenever growth stops. I think one component worth explaining here is that Visa and MasterCard actually only charge a very, very small fraction of the uh, payment price to the merchant. So if, you know, Stripe at the end of it all charges, you know, three and a half percent, Visa and MasterCard only charges 20, 30 basis points of that. The reason why it's so expensive to the uh, end user is there's lots of intermediaries in the process. So there's Visa MasterCard, there's the issuing bank, there is the payment gateway that charges, there's, you know, value added networks that charges a fee. So I, I think there's, you know, six or seven steps that take a fee in the legacy process, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but that's the lay of the land today. So uh, we're taking our blockchain uh, network and replacing the entirety of that stack uh, rather than just replacing Visa MasterCard. But in order to do that, we need to find a way to incentivize users to adopt. And I think our blockchain economy uh, and the seniorage profits that, that result is a way to get people to adopt. The second is obviously the transparency that blockchain provides. So we started off with a 25 e-commerce unicorn network across Asia, and we were able to form this alliance, not only by the value proposition that we proposed, but uh, you know they're all uh, participating uh, in some shape or form as uh, Luna holders, and they've participated in the uh, design of the blockchain itself. So uh, I think the transparency allows us to really form trust with the initial partners that will allow us to grow to a network, uh, you know, kind of like Starwood uh, across hotels or, uh, you know, airline points across uh, airline industry. Okay, Daniel, where can, where can people learn more about uh, Terra and potentially even, I guess, like to our listeners in Korea, uh, start using it uh, to pay for things? Chai is you know, top 10 ranked finance app in Korea today. So on App Store and Google Play, you can download and sign up and uh, start using it on e-commerce. And uh, for Terra, we have a Discord room up and running so you can join and, and participate in the community and discussions. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, th thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>